Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. We look forward to this event every year. We look forward to the opportunity we have to interact with the public, uh, explain what we do for the community um, when, it, when we have a hurricane event. And today we'll do that. We'll explain what we did with Hurricane Irma. We'll have uh, five different department directors here, as well as our weather consultant, Dave Roberts. We'll explain what we did before the storm, during the storm, and then after the storm. And outside we have our uh, hurricane pass program in place. So if you don't have a hurricane pass, you'll be able to uh, fill out your application and get one today. And you can get one uh, during any business day at the police department as well. So um, I know a lot of faces in the, in the audience uh, this morning, but not everyone. So just for a quick introduction, my name is Bill Dalton. I'm the police chief here on Sanibel. Uh, I was, I've been the chief for just a little over a year. And um, in my first year of chief, I got to experience uh, Hurricane Irma. <laughs> so as a matter of fact, the funny thing about it is uh, Hurricane Irma hit on September 10th of 2017. Uh, September 9th of 2017 was my 50th birthday, and uh, I had a different party in mind, but, but a hurricane will change those things. So, um, But like I said, we have a lot of good information to deliver for you today, or deliver to you, and then afterwards we're going to have basically a, a, a question and answer session. We don't want to sit here and, and, and uh, just bore you with a PowerPoint presentation. We usually get our best information and glean our best information from the community when we're having a, dis a discussion, and that's what we'll do today. So to get things started, I'll introduce our weather consultant, Dave Roberts, and he'll come up and, uh, and start the presentation for us. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I wore my sunshine tie again for good luck. It's worked for us so far, right? <laughs> Last few storms. So by the way, I just realized something. The chief's birthday is September 10th. That is the peak of hurricane season. There is more hurricane activity. You'll see it in my presentation. There's more activity on September 10th than probably any other time in hurricane season. Um, it's good to be with you all again uh, this year. Um, how many of you have been to one of our hurricane seminars before here? All right, awesome. And so we have some newbies in the crowd too. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about what the real risks are here to Sanibel. And of course, things have changed. If you've been to our seminars before, you, uh, you of course know uh, when I used to do these seminars uh, before Hurricane Charlie, I had a different mantra. Uh, then Hurricane Charlie happened. Also, before Hurricane Charlie, I didn't need these. Uh, but things have changed. Times have changed. So uh, we're here to talk about hurricanes. And if they could just put up my presentation, uh, I'll be able to show that to you. Um, do I have to hit advance or is it there? Aha, it's already there. Look at that. And um, we're here to talk about hurricane season 2018. I thought it'd start off with a little humorous note there. Uh, just to show you, though, uh, there's the eye of that hurricane. Did I hit the wrong button? Oh, wait, no, there we go. Okay, hurricane season averages. So in any hurricane season, uh, we're going to get about 12 named storms, whether they're hurricanes or tropical storms. Now, hold on. Not here on Sanibel. I'm talking about everywhere, whether it's the Atlantic, the Gulf, all right, or the Caribbean. Over the course of the season, there'll be 12 named storms. Six of those storms, roughly half, will be in fact hurricanes. So about six of those are going to be tropical storms. It's a 50-50 mix. And then three of those six hurricanes will be considered major hurricanes. So one of the things that I wanna show you here is this is a map of the globe that shows you pretty much where all of the hurricane tracks have taken place in history. So the question becomes, why does everybody pick on Florida? Well, Florida's in there somewhere. Um, in fact, here are all the tracks from about 18, the 1850s to 2015. The question I have is, do you, does anybody think I missed one? If, if you do, please uh, get with me after the seminar and we will go over these lines to make sure I didn't miss any. But you can see Florida's pretty much covered up there. So there's a vast hurricane history. We stick out into the hurricane belt, so to speak. Hurricane structure, we know we need certain ingredients for hurricanes to happen. Warm water is the most important thing. Uh, we start as just a cluster of thunderstorms. Water temperature needs to be 80 degrees. By the way, our water temperature right now is about 76, 77. We're good so far, but we're going to spend just about all of hurricane season above 80. And by the way, hurricanes can happen any month out of the year. Now we do have a hurricane season, obviously, but they can happen any month out of the year. I've been lobbying Sanibel City Council to outlaw hurricanes um, outside of that time frame, but so far, uh, no luck. 
Uh, you can see we go from thunderstorms. Once they get organized, they become a tropical depression. Then when the, and we give them a number. Okay, that's where you get the numbers. Tropical depression one, tropical depression two. Um, then when that storm gets 39 mile an hour winds, that's the magic number, we call it a tropical storm. We alphabetize them. And then when it goes from a tropical storm to a hurricane, we keep the name the same, but we just categorize the hurricane, whether it's a one, a two, a three, a four, or a five. So we always talk about El Nino. I'm sure you've heard plenty about it. What does it mean? Uh, how does it impact us? And it greatly impacts our hurricane season. El Nino, the simplest way to put it, El Nino is when the Pacific really warms up. And on our planet, things are trying to maintain a balance. So the Pacific warms up, the Atlantic cools down. And when you have that, that's usually good news for us because it means less activity, less warm water around here. That's better news for us. This is the way it looks when you're talking about a La Nina. That's the opposite of an El Nino. And a La Nina shows that the bulk of the warm water is in the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf and the Caribbean. Now here's the problem. We're in a little bit of a La Nina right now. The good news is the La Nina is not as strong. It's weakening a little bit, but water temperatures farther out into the Atlantic as we talk here in this month of uh, April, we have water temperatures that are running a degree or two warmer currently in the Atlantic. So these are things to pay attention to. And this is really the comparison, how it impacts our weather directly. On the left-hand side of your screen there, you see we're talking about the cold, colder water in the Atlantic. All right, that's in El Nino, because the Pacific is warm, the Atlantic is cool. There's not as many hurricane tracks, but you see what happens when you look on the right, you're dealing with a warm Atlantic Ocean. There's far more activity. So this is something to be concerned about. We are paying attention to it, but I always tell people the same thing. And I wanna go back to this real quick. I always tell people the same thing. Um, we focus so much on hurricane season. People stop me constantly. Um, and they say, well, what's hurricane season gonna be like? And I tell them, we're gonna have hurricanes. Um, because as you know, there's a gazillion forecasts that come out for hurricane season, all right? Um, the consensus of what I look at is what I put together, and it shows we're going to have a normal, if not an above normal season, all right? Very similar to last year. Well, last year we were very lucky, manner of speaking, we were very lucky compared to other places. Here's the uh, chart that I was going to show you, and again, um, I didn't realize this until today, but it, it coincides with the chief's birthday. I mean, you cannot argue with science, folks. So. Um, but it just shows you the vast, vast activity occurs around then. Now we do get some activity in the outlying months. September is the peak month for activity. August is the second busiest. October is the third. And then November is the fourth. So even around Thanksgiving, we can still be talking about this stuff. So keep that in mind. Storm surge is probably our biggest risk. Yes, we know we can get flooding rains here on Sanibel, even though we're an island. We know winds when they're dangerous, and we're actually very good at predicting winds and predicting rainfall. The issue comes to storm surge. And I get asked this seminar, I remember when I first started doing these seminars, and um, I was doing one on another island, not Sanibel, and the nice person came up to me afterwards and they said, I know you said we're at sea level. I understand that, but what's the highest point on the island? And I told that person, it's irrelevant. Because when you get a storm surge, okay, you don't want to be anywhere near it. A foot of rushing water, one foot, will take you to the ground and can lift an SUV. All right, can move a car. So you don't want to be anywhere close to that. Now, a question came up in the audience before uh, and we're going to take a lot of questions at the end, but I want to address this specifically. When we talk about storm surge, if we say we're expecting a 15-foot storm surge, heaven forbid, um, that means the water, the, the, the base elevation of the water, the mean sea level, is going to rise 15 feet. On top of that 15 feet, you will have waves. So if there's six-foot waves on top of it, 10-foot waves, um, the storm surge is the least of your problems. Because once that storm surge comes in, the, the crashing waves and the rushing water, that will do all the damage that needs to be done. So I, I can't stress enough, even when we're predicting a three to five foot storm surge, you're being told to evacuate. And by the way, that's a much more likely scenario than anything. I, I tried to tell people, you know, don't get carried away by these incredible statistics because we try to, you know, it's human nature. We catastrophize things. All right. I don't, though. I have to sit there and really look at the risks that, that are involved in every storm impacting us. And I can tell you that a 15-foot storm surge 
is unlikely from a probability standpoint. A three to five foot one, very likely. We've seen it many times here. And by the way, does a ton of damage. And I don't care if you're on stilts, I don't, it, it will do a ton of damage because when you have cars crashing into stilts, when you have cars moving around and other objects and other houses in that storm surge, what do you think it does? So I can't stress enough that um, three to five foot storm surge, whether it's two feet, three feet, six feet, makes no difference. It's still deadly, okay? So please just understand that. Okay, I'm done preaching on that. Um, as you can see, storm surge is a real issue here on Sanibel. If you're anywhere in the orange or red, you're at high risk, all right? Sorry if you didn't see that on the brochure when you first moved down here, um, but that's the reality of it. We're not alone though. We have several other islands and beach communities and frankly, um, uh, even in South Fort Myers, folks that are several miles inland that think that they're okay, no, because all of those creeks and rivers can back up. So please keep that in mind. There's actually a little advantage to Sanibel. Uh, the storm surge, the odds of getting a storm surge of 15 feet are statistically lower. The odds of getting a storm surge that high in the Caloosahatchee River up by Fort Myers, much higher. I can tell you that Fort Myers has had 10 foot storm surges in downtown Fort Myers um, in recorded history. So understand that uh, while that's some good news, uh, it's not good news from a, 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 a standpoint of survivability. We're gonna take questions at the end of the seminar, but please keep that question. All right, I wanna show this real quick. Um, so what are the real odds of seeing a, a tropical storm or a hurricane here? Well, in any given year, whether it's going to be a, a tropical storm or a hurricane, believe it or not, it's flip a coin. 50% chance it'll be a tropical storm, 50% chance that it would be a hurricane. There have been 54 in about 140, 150 years. And so when I say 54, that means storms that have come within 60 miles of Sanibel. We get one brush about every 32 months. So every two to three years, uh, we get a brush by one of these systems and a direct hit, meaning something that makes landfall within 60 miles of Sanibel. We get that about every decade. All right, so every decade that happens. There are gaps of storms that are incredible. The gap that we used to boast about the most was the difference between Hurricane Donna, which came in 1960, and Hurricane Charlie, which came in 2004. And obviously, that was a phenomenal stretch, 44 years, and we were all happy about that. Well, that stretch is over, obviously, because we deal with these threats, it seems, a lot more often. Now, of course, we always talk about the hurricane models, and everybody, you know, uh, one of the things that I have to do with the city of Sanibel is um, not pick one, but I pick some of the most reliable ones and I say, hey, here's what the real risk to Sanibel is. But this is a thing where we have now folks at home that think they can go to Vegas and bet on this stuff. Uh, it's like uh, picking a horse, doesn't work that way. There are probably 200 plus hurricane forecast track models now to look at. And a lot of them are not reliable depending on the situation. So that's part of my job in communicating with the city is I narrow down those uh, those models and I say okay well what, what appears to be the best scenario here and the worst case scenario and I usually focus on the worst case scenario because uh, the city of Sanibel as you know did if you were here in Hurricane Charlie did an incredible phenomenal job in that storm uh, dealing with it and um, we try to over plan and that's really the goal of everything so um, hurricane models if you if you know a special hurricane model that, that I don't know about please tell me but I can tell you right now they're coming out with this new technology time and time again and the accuracy is improving by the way okay the accuracy is improving we, we can chart that success how much is it improving about one to two percent a year well this has been going on now for 20 30 years so that's a big deal so we're getting much better now on narrowing the stuff down when people tell you oh they have no idea where it's going that's not true we have a pretty good idea where these storms are going but of course every storm is unique and i think that's why it's important we convey that to you that we don't pick the same hurricane model for every storm that pops up in the atlantic so what can we count on what can we count on, folks? Well, we can count on death and taxes, and we can also count on hurricane season every year from June 1st through November 30th. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for your time, as always. Okay, I'm going to hang around here to answer any questions you may have after the seminar, but we're going to keep things flowing this morning. All right, thank you again. Thank you, Dave. Before we move into the part of the presentation that's specific about what we did as a city, 
I'd just like to, th uh, to say that I think one of the reasons we are successful in our planning and our evacuation and our recovery is because all the department directors here, um, we enjoy a great level of support from our city council. And it would be much more difficult for us to do our job without such a supportive council. We have one of our uh, council persons in the audience today, Councilwoman Smith, would you raise your hand? Thank you for your attendance and your support. So uh, what we'll do now is go into what the various different departments did uh, before, during, and after the storm. So us as a police department, um, in preparation for, for Irma, uh, obviously we monitor the, st the storm's progress. We send a, a liaison to the Lee County Emergency Operations Center, and we had three uh, people that performed that task for us this year. One of them's in the audience with us here. Joel, thank you for your efforts with that. Um, we begin our uh, initial preparations for evacuating the island, and we move our department into what we call Alpha and Bravo shifts. That means every sworn officer in the department is on a 12-hour shift from either uh, 6 in the morning till 6 at night or 6 at night till 6 in the morning. That just uh, basically increases our coverage on the road of, of sworn personnel that will help in various different areas. Um, during the evacuation portion of the of, of, uh, uh, hurricane event, I have to testify at the special city council meeting. Um, we begin the evacuation of Sanibel and, Cap and Captiva. Um, we enforce all ordinances regarding, regarding the uh, sale of alcohol and curfews and so forth. And we begin to move our staff either to our temporary city hall uh, at, uh, over at the bell tower or if we have a, uh, 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 sh a shelter for our first responders, the uh, sworn law enforcement officers, um, medics, and, and firefighters. We also provide security um, during the evacuation. We ensure that there's a timely and orderly evacuation. And we leave a security team of officers on the island till the, the last safe time to, to get off and get over the causeway. In the reentry portion, we set up a, uh, basically like a roadblock at the toll booth so we don't have folks coming onto the island that are uh, looking to get into things that they shouldn't. Uh, we, we coordinate to allow the entry of recovery workers. Uh, we did a, a windshield assessment this time, which basically means we, we've, we drove around the island and looked for damage to both uh, residential property and commercial and business property. If the damage is significant, then we'll move to the next portion of our damage assessment, which would be our structural safety inspectors. This time, the damage wasn't that significant, so we did not move forward with that. Um, we coordinate with Public Works to help uh, remove debris, and that's mainly we provide folks to help direct traffic when they have all the heavy equipment out on the roadway. And then we coordinate with the city council for the complete reopening of the causeway. With that said, that's a, a nutshell of what the police department did. There were many other things we, we did also, and we can discuss that if anyone has some questions you know, at the end. But I'll turn a portion of the presentation over to our public works director, uh, Keith Williams. And I, I have said before in small groups, but in the recovery process, Keith Williams was the hardest working man on the island. And he had a very difficult uh, challenge, and, and he didn't flinch at all. So it's, it was excellent to have him on the team. Keith? Thanks, Chief, and thanks for the kind words. And as the Chief mentioned, uh, I'm Keith Williams. I'm your Public Works Director and City Engineer for the City of Sanibel. And um, we appreciate everybody showing up here today because obviously, as a barrier island, we take hurricane season very seriously. So give you a quick outline of what our department's role was and our experiences through Irma that would be kind of reflective of, uh, of any kind of hurricane. But I do want to say, and I think uh, Dave Roberts mentioned this, every storm is different and our response to every storm is going to be different and unique. And so it usually has to do with what the conditions are on the ground. Uh, but Irma was a great test of our, our ability and our skills and our preparation. So we're very pleased with the way things went through Irma. So in regards to the Public Works Department, as we get to preparations when a storm is bearing down, the Public Works Department is responsible for uh, hardening and, and safing all of our facilities, City Hall, uh, the beach parks, the Public Works facility itself. Um, we're also responsible for staging signs and barricades to prepare for any kind of voluntary or mandatory evacuations associated with it. Um, we go ahead and prep and stage all of our emergency response equipment. We have a fleet of generators prepared. 
for our facilities. We have generators prepared for um, our lift stations for when sewer can come back online. And we have equipment prepared to start clearing roadways and other accesses in response to a storm. So we get all that prepped and ready to go so that we can respond as quickly as possible after the storm passes. Um, we also begin coordinating responses with our contractors. We don't do all this alone, as you probably saw after Irma. And so we make sure that the contractors that we have on board to do the work with us are ready to go. So again, that we can respond as quickly as possible after the storm. So during the evacuation, we're primarily in an assistance role with the police department. They're gonna head up the evacuation, make sure we can get everybody uh, off the island as safely and as efficiently as possible. We will go around, as we did during Irma, in the last moments while it's still safe to be on the island and look for any kind of additional items out around the island, whether it be garbage cans or any kind of debris that we can collect and harden to keep from becoming some kind of airborne object or additional source of damage with the storm passing. We know that when everybody has to evacuate, it's a very stressful time for our residents. You may forget that you have a garbage can sitting out on the road or you know, your recycling bins or something to that effect. And we actually tried to go around the island as much as possible in those last moments, making sure we weren't leaving anything out there that could become an airborne hazard and cause additional damage. So during re-entry, uh, Public Works is usually some of the first people back on the island. Uh, in Hurricane Charlie, they were some of the first personnel that came over to the island on boat uh, since the causeway wasn't open to be passed. Uh, with Irma, we came across the causeway first thing in the morning after the storm passed, and we started evaluating the roadways and other accesses for re-entry. As you can see, here's a photo of one of the trees, and we had dozens and dozens. There, I don't think there was a single section of the island that didn't have trees of this magnitude and size blocking access. Most people didn't see this because we tried to get it cleared as quickly as possible, but this was a very typical scene block after block after Hurricane Irma. Uh, so it's our responsibility to start mobilizing and get what we call the first push done, which is to try to get the roadways clear. Because we know that um, whether there were people who opted uh, against the evacuation us to stay on the island or those who want to get back on as quickly as possible, we need to be able to provide that quality infrastructure to have the emergency services get around the island, people to get back to their homes and houses. So we refer to it as the first push, but generally it's the first 72 hours. We're doing everything we can to try to get the roadways back open for quality passage and safe access. In the meantime, when we're doing all this, we activate, again, our contractual relationships with our disaster recovery company so that we can get them on board and we can start the major response efforts where we actually are picking up the larger pieces of debris, assessing other damage to parts of the infrastructure. And through that, we start to develop a coordinated effort. For those of you who are around or, or monitor things during Hurricane, Her Hurricane Irma, we issued a lot of press releases about where we stood because what we did is we go through, we notify the residents, and we want to get all the hurricane debris, especially vegetative debris, piled up a, a, on the side of the roadway so that we can be as efficient as possible in picking up that debris and cleaning our road and our island up. Um, you know, we were able to do it. We had over 171,000 cubic yards of vegetative debris from Hurricane Irma that it generated. Um, and we were able to have just about all that picked up by Thanksgiving. So it's a testament to the ability to kind of work with the residents and do that pickup. What you see photoed here is uh, we actually activate what we call our debris uh, monitoring site or debris recovery site where we actually haul all that debris. Uh, it's all tracked by volume so we can request FEMA reimbursement and then we reduce that debris. We grind it down into mulch so that we can haul it off or use it elsewhere in accordance with FEMA standards all in an effort to be as efficient as possible and get the island back up and running. Throughout all of this, we try to keep the public notified through everything. What we do is we know that according to FEMA standards, we are going to be able to do at least two complete sweeps of the island when we do vegetative recovery. So I don't know how many of you here are seasonal versus full-time residents, but the full-time residents, I'm sure, saw the trucks going around the island as we did our sweeps collecting the debris. If you are a seasonal resident, you might not have seen it, but we tried to keep track of everything about where we stood on the island so we knew that we would at least go by every property on Sanibel at least twice to make sure that anybody that had any hurricane debris that they brought out to the street we could recover and pick up to allow you to recover just and in, in normalize your life as well on your own property. So in doing that uh, we keep track of everything so we can get the FEMA reimbursement for it and, um, and make sure that we're as efficient as possible and basically protecting our island and getting back to normal life. So with that I'll also hand over to uh, James Evans, our Director of Natural Resources and their role associated with Hurricane Irma. Thank you, Director Williams. I'm James Evans. I'm Director of Natural Resources for the city. I've been with the city for the past 18 years, and I was here for Hurricane Charlie. And uh, as the previous speakers indicated, all of the storms are very different from one another. And obviously, our um, preparation, our um, 
during storm activities and post storm activities um, were all very different than I think Hurricane Charlie. Um, but obviously, um, we, we train as, as, as we fight. And uh, in this case, I think the city was well prepared. And um, we were able to get the job done and uh, do it efficiently. And um, we've talked a lot about the different departments. But um, today, the city manager isn't here today. But I also want to I'll let you know that you probably have the hardest working city manager in the entire state of Florida. So um, she's she works extremely hard. She was our um, public information officer throughout the throughout the project or throughout the um, hurricane. And uh, we worked uh, very closely with her uh, in executing our plan. So um, I just wanted to mention uh, she's not here today, but um, very hard working city manager. So the natural resource department, we have four uh, full-time biologists in our department, uh, two of which are here today. We have Dana Detmar, who's our environmental specialist. And we also have Joel Cowett, who's our conservation officer. Uh, myself, as well as Holly Milbrandt, who is our uh, environmental biologist. All of us uh, work very closely together uh, with the other city departments. Um, but during hurricane uh, events and preparation and, and execution and recovery, um, we're really um, working as part of the team. We're um, you know, filling in where needed. Uh, doing a lot of activities that are really kind of outside of the natural resources uh, scope. Um, but as far as uh, pre-storm preparations, um, we, we did uh, pre-storm beach surveys, uh, evaluating all of the uh, conditions prior to the storm hitting, uh, areas where we might expect erosion, and also evaluating some of the projects that we had uh, that were ongoing, some of our beach and shoreline, uh, living shoreline projects, uh, areas that we needed to shore up the, um, the beach to, to make sure that um, we didn't see additional erosion. We documented that through drone surveys. We have a contractor that works with us uh, to do some, 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 um, some flight surveys as well as on foot walking the beaches and documenting the current conditions. Uh, we also briefed our vegetation contractors that work for the city to make sure that they were ready, had all the tools and equipment needed, that once the storm passed they were able to come on, on site similar to the way Public Works uh, did with their contractors uh, so that they can be on site and, and working as quickly as possible for recovery. And then we also secured all of our field equipment, our fire equipment. Uh, many of the people in our department are also licensed and certified to uh, conduct prescribed fires and, and help fight wildfires. So we had all that equipment ready to go as well pre-storm. Uh, as far as uh, during the evacuation, uh, our staff implemented their family emergency plans, making sure that they had everything uh, at home ready to go. So when the city needed them to execute the city's emergency plan, they were ready to go. And, and all of the staff were able to get that done in a timely manner and report back to duty. Um, all staff assisted with the literature drop, uh, assisting other departments like our parks and rec department, planning departments, public works, all the folks that were out providing literature door to door uh, prior to the storm event hitting. Uh, when their families were all at home getting ready for the hurricane, our staff were all out um, making sure that our community here on Sanibel was safe. And then our conservation officer I mentioned earlier, Joel Cowett, reported directly to the uh, Emergency Operations Center in Fort Myers uh, to help as a, uh, one of the liaisons to the, um, to the county uh, for the city of Sanibel. And he worked there during the storm and after the storm. Several weeks after the storm, uh, Joel was reporting to the Emergency Operations Center. When the, the storm was making landfall, um, we had uh, several of our staff in different places throughout the storm. As I mentioned, Joel was at the Emergency Operations Center. Uh, I was actually with the city operations in North Fort Myers, um, tracking the storm uh, with, and reporting directly to the city manager, and she was dire reporting directly to city council. Our city public works director was there as well as our IT department and several other folks with the city. We were actually um, tracking a lot of the data that was available to us this year, which was very different than Hurricane Charlie. Um, now we have uh, what are called um, recon uh, real-time water quality monitoring sensors throughout the Caloosahatchee and our coastal waters, which actually provided us real-time data throughout the storm so that we could actually look at and anticipate what the storm surge might be based on the meteorological predictions uh, that were provided um, to the city. Uh, as well as the real-time conditions that we were seeing in the field. And that was really helpful to make sure that the city manager and city council were updated on what we could expect and what damage might be expected as, as part of the storm surge. Um, and again, I really want to give a shout out to the Sanibel Captiva Conservation Foundation for implementing that program. That's funded uh, through private and public donations, and um, that's really been a, a, a tremendous resource and asset to the city of Sanibel during this event. Uh, and then um, finally, we also tracked uh, a lot of the um, information that was available from the state of Florida 
on Lake Okeechobee and the Clusahatchee so that we knew where the elevation of Lake Okeechobee was and what we could expect uh, pre, post, uh, pre, during, and post storm event. <clears throat> it wasn't just the impacts that we saw during the storm uh, from, the, from the freshwater discharges. It was also the <clears throat> several months after the storm when the lake level had exceeded you know, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, operational um, uh, range, um, they actually had to conduct very high level regulatory discharges from the lake into the Clusatchee, which actually impacts, impacted our coastal waters for several, several months after the storm. So those were things that we were able to track this year that we weren't able to track uh, during Hurricane Charlie. <clears throat> when it comes to re uh, recovery and reentry, uh, all of our staff uh, are part of the structural, the city's structural safety inspector team. Um, that team was not really mobilized this time, at least they were able to do it in-house with the, with the department or the, um, the building department staff, um, but we were ready to go in the event that we needed to go out there and assess the home so we can get you back island very quickly um, and we'll be ready next time as well. Uh, our conservation officer was at the EOC for several weeks after the event, uh, but continued to um, get resources for the city of Sanibel during our recovery efforts. And once City Hall was reopened, all of our staff uh, reported back to City Hall. We conducted beach inspections, um, beach surveys, and evaluated the impacts of the storm event. And then, of course, we uh, worked directly with our public works department and consulted on everything from uh, water management within the, um, within the interior wetlands of the island uh, to beach cleanup, debris removal, uh, and other um, habitat and, and other um, vegetation-related matters. This year was very different from, or this event was very different from Hurricane Charlie um, because a lot of the Australian pines that were here during Hurricane Charlie came down. And of course, we had months and months of, of, of recovery during, after Hurricane Charlie, where we actually had to conduct prescribed burns to burn the, the vegetative debris. Um, we had issues getting debris off the island because of the causeway. Um, but this, fortunately, during this event, um, the recovery efforts after Hurricane Charlie helped us um, get rid of a lot of that vegetation debris um, and this you know this event the vegetation was much more resilient stood up much better to the hurricane force winds um, unfortunately um, directly director Williams didn't have to deal with as much hurricane debris as he did in previous events so with that I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the building department we got um, our building official uh, Harold Law who's going to talk to you a little bit about their uh, their uh, participation <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, the building department's a little different than other departments. We think about hurricanes every day of every year. We work with the homeowners and the builders to prepare your structures so that they will withstand hurricane winds. We work with FEMA and elevations to make sure that your structures are above their predicted storm surge heights to protect your homes so that you can come back to one. Um, we promote the FEMA flood insurance that you all should have since you're in a flood zone. Um, but uh, and a lot of people opt out to that. But you can uh, purchase with the extra work we do with FEMA to make sure that you can uh, get your insurance. Uh, there's other jurisdictions that are having problems today, may not be able to get insurance, even if they are in the flood zone. So with that being said, we work on it year round. That's all the preparation for the structure and stuff. But we also have a group we call the structural safety inspectors, which are uh, not handpicked, but we, we look for people that want to work on the structural safety team, which is about a 40 member team that have, structure, uh, have either structural or con contra construction background so they understand what's going on with structures when we go out in the field. Uh, we take that team and we work every year annually. We have a weekend we will work and go through classes and work with the new equipment we've got. When Hurricane Charlie hit, the structural safety inspectors went out with blank paper forms and pencils and wrote down everything that they saw. And then we spent all night inputting that into a computer so the next day we could tell you what had happened. Today, we have computer systems that we are trained on now 
that you will be updated on the conditions of your property as they walk by them and evaluate them. They will be online that quick. So a lot of things have changed with the structural safety inspectors. Uh, it's kind of unique that the building department works with this, but uh, instead of inspecting for construction, now we're inspecting for destruction. Uh, but we've got a great team. If anybody's here that's never heard of this before and you've got a construction background, uh, I would like for you to come and talk to me because we're always looking for good candidates to be on this team. Uh, before the storm, uh, we get in contact with every structural safety inspector, find out where they're going, where they're going to be during the storm, phone numbers to get a hold of them with. Uh, during the storm, uh, we coordinate with the city manager of what our next step will be. Uh, after the storm, we will then determine whether we need them or not. Uh, Charlie, we really needed them. Irma, uh, the police evaluation was so minimal that the building department could actually handle any damage that we had, so we didn't have to call them in this year, which is a great thing. But we are prepared with the most cutting edge equipment than you can imagine to go out and do this evaluation. How many was here during uh, Charlie. Do you remember after Charlie trying to figure out what happened to your house and what condition it was in? We had all the meetings at night and everybody was wondering, you know, that will never happen. You'll be able to know within 10 minutes. So that's a great thing. And so now we are prepared for the next hurricane. Hopefully it's after I retire, but we'll see. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bert Smith. I'm the IT director. I've been with the city since 1998. Um, at that time, we had very little technology. We had two servers, a couple of computers, and only a few people had email. So back then, planning for hurricanes was pretty much paper and pencil. And also back then, technology was very expensive, so we didn't do a, uh, a lot of implementations of technology unless we could back it up because we weren't sure that it was going to be available. As time has gone by, Technology has come down in cost, connectivity has increased, so we can actually now implement a lot of technology to help us with regular business and make it enableable during uh, disasters. So we've been doing that for the last couple of years. We've moved a lot of our systems off of Sanibel. Sanibel is a dangerous place, obviously, so we don't want to have to rely on any of our systems being here. So if they're here, they're backed up. And actually, most, a lot of the systems we have right now aren't even on Sanibel anymore. Our dispatching systems at the Sheriff's Department, our emails in Office 365, our uh, financial systems are cloud hosted, data is backup hosted, that sort of thing. So we have a lot of roles to do whenever a disaster comes in advance. One of the biggest things that we do is we set up a temporary city hall somewhere safe. The Administration Department and Emergency Management decides where that's going to be. Um, our department, including myself, is five people, and then we go and do, we prepare City Hall for the hit of a storm, and we prepare the off-island disaster location. Um, actually, one of my people's on staff, Brad, he's back there. It's his job once we decide to deploy, he deploys all the technology, and this year it was at Bell Tower. This storm was a little different because it also risked that location, so we had to move some of our stuff to an alternate location. So in addition to setting that up, at the very end of this preparation, we had to set up somewhere else as a secondary location as well. So we set up everything that we think that the city and that the users have requested at these locations. And as I said, in this particular case, we had to deploy a smaller set of equipment and a team to North Fort Myers. We also take care of all the after hours uh, communications. So our website, hopefully you've seen that, mysanibel.com, is sort of a hub for where we can get to everything. We have, uh, for elevation certificates that the city has, they're on there somewhere in the uh, document management system. Uh, press releases go there. We also um, push messages out to social media. I don't know if, how many people know we have an app, a traffic app? Good. 
So if you go to Apple or um, Android, it's called Sandcams or Sanibel Bound. We're working on the third release right now. The, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Now, as part of the preparation, with all the technology we have at City Hall, we also have to make it safe. If the storm is going to require a full evacuation, which is pretty much any hurricane, we may have to totally shut down City Hall. That means our generator can't come back on. We don't want the UPSs to run. We don't want any problems in case water intrudes into the building. So we turn everything off and uh, secure the equipment on site. For the re-entry, we have to do the reverse. So like on Charlie, um, I was one of the people that was on the boat with the Public Works guys. We came back, turned on City Hall. Our primary focus is to try and get dispatch up as soon as possible. Um, they can do work without the technology. They have handheld radios. You know, a lot of things can work right away. But obviously, we want to have full access to dis dispatching systems. Um, you know, it's going to be during a major hurricane when all these systems are going to help us coordinate how to respond to everything. So I just want to mention uh, Sanibel Bound, the next version of the app. Um, right now, version 2, which is in the store, or which is available, and um, most people who have downloaded it probably are running that version, it also has something called push notifications. So as long as you have connectivity, and we have connectivity, you'll be able to, we'll be able to push out emergency notifications through the application. We haven't done that yet, because we're only planning to use it for specifically emergencies. Um, the next version that's going to come out soon is going to have a few more cameras. Um, and it's also going to have a travel estimator to estimate how long it's going to take to get off Periwinkle going either down the main route, uh, down Periwinkle, or going around. I want to warn you, this is Google's estimates. You know, we don't want to write our own. They've done a pretty good job of that, so we can't be responsible for what Google tells you. Um, but the next release of the application is going to have some pretty interesting things in it. Thanks a lot. That'll conclude our presentation for today.